My name is Hannah Hoffmann Hüter. I'm from uh, uh, I'm the head of consulting uh, at Eurofins Professional Scientific Services in Germany, uh, located in Munich. Um, and I want to give you a small update uh, about the upcoming changes that we are expected for the ISO 10993 uh, series. So first I want to talk about the testing strategy, the current testing strategy that we have, and then uh, the next point is the new testing strategy according to the ISO 109931, which will be changed, and then uh, a small update about um, other additional changes during the ISO 10993 series, which uh, we are expected 2017 and 2018. So first, uh, summarize uh, what is the biological evaluation of medical devices. The biological evaluation of medical devices is performed to determine the potential toxicity resulting from contact of the component materials of the device with the, with the human body. Uh, the device materials should not produce adverse effect, or local or systemic, so there should be no irritation, no sensitization effects, should not be carcinogenic, so genotoxicity should not be available, and should not produce reproductive and development effects. And it's very important that this assessment of biocompatibility is always performed on the final finished device. So sometimes we can start it with, a, uh, um, with a not finished devices, but um, it's very important to have the final finished devices and the end. The biological evaluation program shall include some uh, important information about the physical and chemical characteristics of materials, of the raw materials that you use for your medical device, um, sometimes his, um, history of clinical use or human exposure data that you have, existing toxicology or other biological safety data that uh, you can have during uh, the procedures, test procedures, and also the literature review of existing data. Um, the general principles and guidelines before you started with the biological evaluation, um, the following characteristics and properties of the materials shall be taken into account. The materials of manufacturers of your supplier, so you um, need the information about your polymers, your metals, what you use in the medical devices. Also the intended additives or process contaminants and residues um, do you um, through the um, performance. Extractables and leachable substances, they are coming out from your finished medical device. And if uh, you have a degradation product, also the degradation composition or compounds that they are coming from your products. Other components and their interaction with the final product. That means, for example, if you have uh, packaging, uh, from some stuff in packaging that uh, can interact with your medical devices, also this information are needed. Uh, for the medical devices, also the performance uh, should um, is required. Um, and then uh, also the physical characteristics of the final product, shape, surface morphology, for example, for the, um, for the medical devices they are interacting with blood, it's the surface morphology, very important, porosity, particle size, um, all the new products, so 3D printed product have particles, um, so uh, it's also um, very important to have um, such information about, about the particle size and so on. Um, to help us, uh, we have uh, guidance and principles that we can use for evaluation of medical devices and um, also that can be used for the standardization of experiments. The study design should be always uh, in compliance with the uh, international guidelines if you are going to different countries. And the performance of the test uh, should be according the good laboratory practice or the, according the ISO 17025. For the in vivo test, it's sometimes very important 
to have a very good quality, for example, for the implementation test. So uh, you need, um, uh, you must reduce the adverse effect that can be uh, lead from uh, from the animal testing. So that's uh, very important to have a triple lake, uh, yeah, accreditation for the laboratories. And this is the Association for Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. It's a not-profit organization, and um, they be sure that the um, animals are treated in a human way. And um, if you have such uh, sometimes batch release testing, for example, um, like cytotoxicity or TOC testing, so you need also the GMP certification, the good manufacturer practice certification. Oh. Um, the ISO 1993 series is the biological evaluation of medical devices. This is a horizontal standard and applies to extended range of medical devices. So we have different kind of medical devices. There are implants, there are some patches or whatever. Um, the ISO 1993 series consists at the moment of, I think, 20 different parts plus some specific technical reports and additional guidelines. Um, the ISO 10993 is prepared by technical committees, um, the ISO TC 194, and by technical committee CN TC 206 in collaboration. The CNN is the European committee. Um, the guidelines uh, are continuously developed so um, if you need uh, um, actual guidelines, please visit the ISO website or the, uh, or the CNN website. I give you on the both websites. So this is a um, very long list that we have in the ISO 10931 series. So um, the first part is always the evaluation and testing within the risk management process. So this is the introduction for the testing, and then there are some um, testing guidance that we have. For example, the tests for genotoxicity and carcinogenicity, or we have some guidance for um, the test with interaction with blood, and also the cytotoxicity test, and so go on, implantation, um, tests for ethylene oxide sterilization residues, whatever and then um, the long list follow, and some important uh, parts are always there, for example, the chemical characterization or um, the technical reports that we have, and the new one are uh, the guidance of nanomaterials, because there's very important uh, at the moment in, uh, in Europe, because everything include or um, has composition of nanomaterials and also there's a technical document uh, number 33. Uh, uh, this is the guidance on the um, genotoxicity. This, is, uh, this guidance explain a little bit the performance of the genotoxicity test. Um, now we have 20 guidance but uh, they are not only these ISO 1093 guidance, we have also other and additional guidance. So we have the technical competence according to the ISO 17025 and the good laboratory practice guidance. We have the blue book memorandum. Um, there are also some explanation regarding the plastic test according to the OESP classification. We have the STM uh, testing. Um, we have further international guidance depends uh, in Europe, Japanese, or the, from, from the U.S. countries. Uh, of course, we have also the OECD guidance uh, for testing chemicals. They can be used as a cross-reference for the medical devices testing. For example, if the test um, items can uh, be applied directly, um, eye ointments or something else, which are also medical devices. And we have also further ISO, TC, and CN, TC standards there um, for, um, for example, dental products has 
their own uh, guidance and also the intraocular lenses has their own guidance as example. Um, this is the Annex 1 table, the very famous table that we have at the moment and then um, um, the testing is performed according to such table and we have device categories there. So uh, we have device categories which has only uh, surface contact or uh, are external communicating devices or implant de uh, devices. And then uh, we look at the contact, if they have contact with skin or with blood path indirect with circulating blood. And then we have the contact duration. So we have a three contact duration uh, possibility. One is the limited, prolonged, and permanent. And there are some Xs. Uh, these are the biological effects that you need. So for example, if you have external communicated devices that have only, only a very short um, contact with the tissue, so you should have uh, some information for cytotoxicity, sensitization, irritation, and systemic toxicity. For example, this yellow one. So that gives you a, a, um, a little help uh, to, um, to know what um, the authorities uh, are expected. So the new, um, so last um, meeting in Annapolis from ISO meeting, so we decided to have um, a new ISO 109931. And this is also, this include also the new table one. The new table one uh, is similar to the old one. Um, we have still the uh, categories, surface devices, external communicating uh, uh, parts, and also the implants. We have the similar context, index skin, uh, we have tissue, bone, dentin, whatever. We have also the contact duration is still similar or the same. Um, but we change a little bit the endpoints of the bio biological evaluation. So uh, you see there are no Xs more, um, only one. And the one X is at physical and or chemical information. This is the first row that we have, and this is the new one. So before you started with the biological test, you need uh, information uh, chemical or physical chemical information from your medical device. And then you have the biological test, cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation. And then you have additional neuro, and this is the pyrogenicity that is needed. Um, I think in the old table was only needed for the Japanese authorities, so we included it also in this table. And then the similar uh, biological endpoint that we have. Um, what the X means? The X means uh, need, uh, is needed for a risk assessment. Uh, so you need um, such data for uh, chemical analysis. And E means endpoints to be evaluated in the risk assessment, either through uh, the use of existing data. So if you don't have it, such data, you must perform a test. Or, um, or uh, you can waive such data if you have um, the results from your leachables and extractable studies and there is no um, risk for irritation or sensitization, you can also waive such testing. Uh, for such waiving or for, um, um, yeah, for waiving of such testing, uh, you must justify it, your decision for the authorities. So what is very important, um, this table is not a checklist uh, for testing. So please avoid additional testing if um, there's no needed. So um, you can use um, for, the such, um, so for such assessment existing data. Uh, you can use also um, data from similar products. You can use also database or literature uh, that you have. So uh, please avoid additional testing in, uh, for your medical device. So this is the new strategy. I put the old 
uh, and a little bit red. I think it's red. So the old strategy would be uh, you have three steps. The step one is cytotoxicity. If cytotoxicity not occurs or you have no cytotoxicity observed, you can go in vivo testing, and this is the irritation and sensitization at the moment uh, for medical devices uh, with the same category. Uh, the new strategy is a little bit more points. So um, we have three steps, and now we have six steps. Um, the first step is uh, mandatory. So this is the physical and chemical information that you needed. And based on this data, you decided if you need cytotoxicity, sensitization, irritation, pyogenicity, or acute systemic toxicity data. Um, this is on, uh, based on the results from the chemical information or chemical testing. Usually, uh, most uh, we started uh, at Eurofence uh, to work on this new guidance and also discuss it with the agencies in Europe. And um, they accepted now that we perform um, the chemical information studies and um, one biological test, the cytotoxicity. And if there are no leachable and extractable, they uh, increase the risk for irritation or sensitization. Uh, they don't need such data anymore. So we, we save uh, a little bit more uh, money for uh, for the producer and also save, um, according to the animal welfare, more animals for such testing. So the new strategy will be uh, to perform a chemical analysis and then uh, to perform a risk assessment. That means that if you uh, perform a chemical analysis and you receive the report, so you have some leachables and extractables there, uh, that should be um, uh, yeah, that should be um, analyzed uh, for the risk in human or in patients. So this is the problem that we have: that uh, you must um, uh, perform a risk assessment if there are some gaps or if there are some uh, adverse effect expected from the leachable and extractables. Um, the problem that we have uh, is that the um, guidance ISO 1099318 is uh, the update is um, expected 2018-2019. So um, we um, must work with the with the old guideline until we have uh, the new guideline. Um, this kind of chemical investigation is required to order and to identify possible volatile and extractable toxic substances as well to evaluate their toxicology risk. This investigation also allows uh, to document the chemical comparability, comparability of various production lots and to discover possible material changes of subcontractors. So if um, this is an example, so um, you have a new medical devices in your company and the first question that uh, are coming from the consultancy or for uh, the agency or for the testing facility is, is it, is it final product? And if you say yes, okay. So we are uh, asking also, um, do you have all the raw materials information? And this is sometimes a problem, because if you have polymers, some um, supplier don't uh, give you the composition of such polymers, because it's confidential. So you have sometimes uh, problems if the raw materials composition or, or the information are not there. Um, then the next question will be, uh, are the raw materials, um, yeah, valid for the application for medical devices, can be used for application of medical devices, or are the new materials that are not uh, uh, used in medical devices um, until now? Uh, if um, there are some problems, you need additional testing and also additional discussion with the authorities. If yes, uh, so you can perform the chemical analysis data uh, with um, some tests, 
some tests such as GCMC, LCMC, ECP based on your product. And then you have a report with some leachables and extractables. Um, before you uh, can issue the expert statement for the, um, for the risk assessment, you must ask additional questions. For example, are the chemical analysis data sufficient? Sometimes I uh, see uh, such data that the um, limit of quantification is very high, for example, 5 milligram uh, per device. It's such high value that uh, you can um, not use for your risk assessment. Sometimes there are uh, chemical uh, analysis performed not under GLP and um, they are, it's not validated process, so you must be sure that uh, such testing are validated and perform under GLP. Are the information about the raw materials are sufficient? That means uh, give the supplier of the raw material, give you all data, all information that you needed for your risk assessment. If not, so there is uh, some testing needed um, to fill up such gaps. It's your uh, production process well documented and well defined. Sometimes there is, uh, of course, there are some processes well defined, but some small processes uh, are not defined or not documented. Um, for example, um, usually uh, production process, are, uh, the cleaning process are well documented, but sometimes the storage is not documented, whatever. So you need um, um, very good documentation of your production process. And then uh, if you take the risk factors of the medical devices, you must be sure that um, you have, uh, you must be sure that you have choose the right population. So for example, if uh, your medical device is, you, uh, is used for children or for neonatals, um, they are more sensitive as a uh, patient population. So you need uh, additional risk factors data for such testing. Um, also, the other factors, um, degradation, contact duration, are very important. The strategy process is an important step that uh, you need. Um, it should be well documented and um, well defined. And also, um, you must ask you, uh, is the contamination possible in your process? From packaging, whatever, uh, if there are some, uh, some processes uh, or steps that can issue contamination on your product. Then, um, if you have uh, study results or um, if there are study results available, so you must ask uh, about the validity of your results. Are the tests performed? under the GLP, under the ISO, um, are the positive controls include, are the um, tests validated, um, um, are there adverse effects coming from your medical devices? Uh, for example, if you are performing in vitro testing, um, is the pH, osmolality or whatever increase, uh, which can lead to adverse effects in the cell culture? Or if you use, for example, implantation a study, um, also the um, adverse effect uh, during the treatment uh, can lead to um, false in interpretation, interpretation of the results. If you use uh, literature data, and they are also available, please check the quality of the data. So you can, um, you can have data from early 60s, 70s, uh, and it's very important to uh, not only to use the abstract, so you need the whole studies. And uh, also you need um, um, the results and also the, um, the explanation of the adverse effect in these studies. And then recheck if there are some other gaps. If there are some risks that you cannot, uh, you cannot um, answer, um, with your results or with your risk assessment. If everything is okay, so you can also apply the toxicological threshold approach. 
or the Kramer class limits um, on your leachables and extractables. The problem for the TTC and also for the Kramer class uh, is that we have um, the TTC value are for lifetime exposure. Some of the medical devices are limited exposure, sometimes only a few minutes, sometimes 20, um, less than 24 hours or 30 days. So there are many differences. And if you um, use the TTC value for lifetime, um, such value um, may overestimate the patient risk from exposure to extractables or leachables chemicals. Um, at the last SOT uh, in Baltimore this year, so we have a discussion regarding the medical devices uh, and the use of TTC concept uh, for such devices. And there was uh, a proposal from Bushi uh, to increase uh, the Kreml class limit uh, for, um, for medical devices uh, which can only be used for prolonged exposure that's mean more than 24 hours or limited exposure less than 24 hours. Um, they perform a retrospective study and look inside uh, if uh, the, um, the risk uh, can be increased uh, during the study and um, they recommended to use um, TTC value of 90 microgram or 180 microgram uh, per uh, kilogram per day in human for Kramer class 1 and for substances they are in Kramer class 3, uh, 4.5 uh, and 9 microgram. Um, I think it's, um, so we discussed it also in our um, DIN meeting in Germany um, because uh, many of uh, such limits that we have at the moment are for the lifetime and not for the uh, medical devices that can be used uh, a very short time to, um, yeah, to avoid such as overestimation and avoid the discussion with the authorities. So um, if you have all data together, so you, uh, the last decision is to have it, uh, the data uh, adequate or sufficient for assessment and you can perform such assessment of biocompatibility or they are not sufficient and uh, you must um, decide if you need additional data and if you need additional data, what kind of data um, um, this should be and uh, all the results are necessary. So this means that uh, you have a, a small decision there. So you need in your company a toxicologist that can uh, perform such expert statement after the uh, chemical analysis and decide and can decide uh, which tests are additionally needed for the risk assessment of your product. Um, this big change that we have in the ISO 109931 is very important and change everything. But um, in our ISO meeting, uh, we decided to have additional changes, uh, which um, I am expecting 2017 and 2018. So it's the word change a little bit more than only uh, with the ISO 109931. Um, the last uh, meeting in Annapolis in the U.S. Um, was um, last autumn, and we decided uh, we have the, some um, um, some talk with Robert Priscoda and his colleagues, and uh, Robert discussed um, uh, the applicability of the current genotoxicity procedures of medical de to medical devices. The problem was that Robert. Um, um, perform a study and uh, look inside and say, okay, um, um, his summary was that the genotoxicity study are not sufficient for the medical devices. And that was, wow. So we uh, test uh, the last 20 years genotoxicity study and see nothing. 
So he explained a little bit more, so medical devices need to be extracted, of course. 80% uh, of all medical devices should be extracted. Other can be applied directly. And the extraction fluid is then applied to the genotoxicity test system because they are in vitro system. Uh, usually you use for such extraction um, physiological saline, DMSO, ethanol, whatever you can use for this test. And uh, only a small amount of this extract can be applied to the in vitro test. It's something between 0 0.5 to 10%. Um, and the problem that we have is, uh, or that Bob saw, that 10% percent are not enough to see any effect, for example, in the in vivo micronuclear test. So I performed the last 10 years a micronuclear test in vivo, and uh, I have only one positive micronuclear test in my career so, uh, for medical devices. So it was not surprising. And uh, he uh, recommended to, um, to discuss uh, the ISO 10993 three, uh, part for genotoxicity and uh, recommended uh, a new testing strategy, not uh, the AIMSTERS, mouse lymphoma assay, and um, in vitro micronuclear test, and um, to have only two of them test and um, uh, look inside if something is wrong that such tests cannot be used for medical devices. Um, the FDA is also uh, involved in such discussion and uh, after the meeting there was, um, there was a small discussion during the meeting and uh, they explained us that uh, FDA do not accept in vivo micronuclear anymore and I have also the information um, the last three months that if somebody has follow up or in vivo micro, uh, micronuclear test after a positive in vitro test, um, that the FDA is not accepted such tests anymore because it's, uh, it's not sensitive enough to detect genotoxicity effect in animals. After the hard discussion according to the ISO 10993 for the genotoxicity, that was the next big discussion and was the discussion uh, regarding um, the extraction methods. The ISO 10913-12 uh, is the extraction methods for medical devices. So we, we have on the other side the genotoxicity test and they lose their sensitivity and they, the other part say, okay, maybe we should change also the, um, the extraction procedure, maybe be more effective and then we can see such effect or such genotoxicity effect in our testing. So we started the discussion uh, last year uh, regarding the ISO 10312 and then the decision was uh, should we perform a round robin to evaluate it, uh, the sensitivity of the extraction. And um, the problem that we had uh, during the meeting was that there was many extraction procedures and uh, many of the countries uh, want not to harmonize such procedures. So we have the U.S. methods. Um, they are uh, coming from the U.S. And then we have, of course, the European methods. They say, okay, the European methods are the best one. And then for the Japanese um, uh, come also some methods. And they say, okay, our methods are perfect and more sensitive than the US and the European methods. And the problem was we was there one week and we had no decision at the moment. So it was still discussion. And I think um, the, uh, the first step will be to have a round robin testing uh, to see which procedure is the best one and uh, we can discuss it, I think, the ne in the next meeting. And the next meeting is in October in South Korea. And um, maybe there's some more information regarding the extraction procedure. 
Then the next point was uh, the absorbable metals. So uh, the problem that we have for the absorbable metals, if you have degradation or something else, uh, for example, if you have magnesium alloys in your stents, um, you cannot use um, the standard test because the concentration of such magnesium alloys is too high and uh, such high concentration produce adverse effect in your testing. So this is not only in vitro testing, you have also adverse effect in vivo testing because you have the extraction for 72 hours and then um, if you, uh, for example, use the magnesium alloys and put it in the uh, physiological saline, you have a very high amount of magnesium uh, in your extract and if you um, applicate it them in, in the animals, the animals die based on the high concentration. So um, um, we discuss uh, that absorbable metals uh, should have a new draft version uh, and maybe a new testing procedure for such medical devices. Uh, at the end of the discussion, the expert from the TC194 uh, decided they are not uh, so much expert there and they need additional expert from uh, another um, committee uh, and involve the uh, TC150. And at the moment, uh, the procedure is that we have a discussion and preparation of the draft version, which um, will be submitted, I think, in three months uh, to the countries for, um, yeah, for discussion. For discussion. Uh, and then um, we came to the next huge problem, this, that was the ethylene oxide residues. So usually we use the ISO 10993 as harmonization guidance. And at the, uh, at the moment we have a problem in, within Europe, in, in the Europe, because uh, the colleague from France um, developed a new limit for children and uh, small children, neonatals, and decided to have a, a new lower limit than, as, than uh, mentioned in the ISO 9937. Um, we have some discussion with the France people and uh, there was all, um, some discussion started to update such limits in, in a new guideline. Uh, but at, uh, at the moment we have the huge problem in, uh, yeah, in Europe that um, the France has lower limits than the other world. And I discussed it also with TÜV Süd, this is the agency in Germany, and they decided also to accept the France limit. So for us, it's very important um, to, update such, uh, to update the guideline, because uh, we have now two limits, uh, one for, um, for other countries and one from, uh, for Europe. And uh, the new limits for children, of course, um, the children and neonate health are a little bit smaller than the normal population if you use uh, adult people, and they are also more sensitive. So it's, um, it's very important also to reduce um, the ethylene oxide residues limits in this guideline. So this was the problem that we have, that we have four very important guidance that will be changed. The ISO 10993 one, uh, I think, change um, in this year, uh, at latest in January 2018, because uh, we have the second discussion on the comments for coming from the countries. And I think in the, uh, in the next meeting in October, so this is the last uh, meeting round that we have, and after um, this meeting, we have uh, then the new ISO 10931 guideline. The ISO 10993 for genotoxicity and also the 12 for the extraction, I think it takes a little bit longer. For example, the, uh, because every in vitro and in vivo tests are depending on the ISO 10931312. 
So we've started first with the 12, with the extraction guidelines, and then I hope we can have it 2018 uh, to have a new procedure and also the res uh, results from round robin. Um, we expected also um, in October that we have uh, the results from the round robin for the cytotoxicity test because um, there is also some uh, points or some uh, differences between Japanese, Europe and the US uh, regarding the cytotoxicity testing. For example, um, in um, Europe we can use the BCA, MPT and XCPSA. Uh, in the US, uh, the FDA recommended uh, the MMM elution assay. And uh, in Japanese, they want to have a colony, um, uh, colony assay with other positive and negative controls. So there's still some, uh, some deharmonization within the countries. But I hope if um, when we have the results from the round robin, we can decide which uh, test for the cytotoxicity can be used. Um, during, I think, the new guideline, uh, the, if you have medical devices um, with contact with the circulating block, um, so you know that um, the guidance is uh, published 2017, and this is a new guideline for the, um, for the testing with the blood. So we have still in, uh, in Europe the possibility to test every medical devices with human blood, but for the hemolysis, the A A uh, ASTM method is the recommended method now in the ISO, not uh, the one with the human blood. So we decided to have uh, both parts inside. So the ASTM method for hemoly hemolysis is uh, performed with rabbit blood, and uh, it's also accepted by FDA and European countries. So we have uh, the change in the ISO 10993 and uh, in the technical reports uh, 33. Uh, we have the change uh, of the extraction methods in the part 12. Uh, we have the part 7 with the ethylene oxide residues that will be changed and um, also the other one uh, for the absorbable metals. Uh, and we expected also that uh, some limits will be changed uh, during the discussion of the ISO 10.9.3.18 for the chemical analysis, because this is the next part that uh, will be discussed 2018. So if I go back to the, uh, to the list of the, uh, of the um, uh, ISO guidance, of the 10993 series. So the change of the part one, okay, um, there is no change uh, in part two of animal welfare requirements. There will be uh, some changes in part three for the genotoxicity. Part four was changed 2017, so please use uh, the new guidance for this one, uh, for the selection uh, of, uh, uh, for the selection of tests for interaction with blood. Um, the test in vitro cytotoxicity, there would, um, uh, the convener will publish the new round robin results, uh, hopefully this or next year. So maybe we have also there an update of new tests. Um, there are no um, changes for the local effects in the implementation. Uh, the part seven will be changed. Um, there is, um, of course, the part nine will be change of the degradation products. There is no change for skin irritation and sensitization, only small changes there. Um, that, um, of course, the in vitro test should be performed before in vivo test. So there was um, a run robin perform for in vitro tests with 3D skin models. Uh, with 3D skin human models uh, from Matic and uh, from Episkin. Uh, Episkin is one from L'Oreal, and they decided um, 
yeah, it takes two years to produce a positive control, and then last year we perform uh, the studies, and it's um, the results are very good. And uh, Wim de Jong uh, publish uh, will publish the results this year, and also there were some meetings with the FDA regarding the acceptance of such testing. So maybe there is also some small um, change to include the in vitro testing in the irritation and sensitization test. Um, there is no change for systemic toxicity. Of course, there will a uh, huge change uh, for the part two sample preparation and reference materials. This is the extric extraction um, guidance. And um, yeah, there is some identification on quantification of degradation will be a little bit updated. And then we have the 18 and 19. Um, the 18 is the chemical characterization of materials, and the 19 is the part physical, chemical, morphological, and topographical characterization of materials. And these two parts will also change this and next year. I expect it, uh, that the change will be uh, 2018. Okay, um, so um, there are many changes at the moment uh, planned for uh, uh, for the um, for the guidance. So um, at first one, um, the ISO 10931 is the very important change because this changed the testing strategy, and then um, the other coming soon. So, and very important for you is that the ethylene oxide residues, if you are going to Europe and to France, you must use the reduced limit for ethylene oxide. So, I still have time for questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, of course.